Cooper is holding a news conference. That's right. This is in from yesterday's uh, protest. Let's take a listen in. Persistent and ugly flames of racism. The unjust killing of George Floyd less than a week ago, combined with many other recent and distant events, broke open painful wounds. These scars mark generations of trauma that black people and other communities of color continue to suffer. Trauma that is too often gone unrecognized in our country. We've had moments of heightened awareness, some right here in our own state, but they faded from the headlines too fast. We've made some progress, but when you see George Floyd on the ground begging for air, you realize that we have so much more work to do. For people of color, these are not just cable news headlines, though. They're life and death warnings. They are stark instructions from parents to children about how to stay safe in their own communities and how to stay safe during encounters with law enforcement. They are heartbreaking memorials for people who should not be dead. George Floyd should be alive, along with many others. All of us should have done more to protect them. In a number of cities across our state over the past two days, protesters gathered to seek justice for them and for themselves and their children. To call for changes to the systemic problems that have allowed racism to endure. Many brought their children with them to show the importance of calling for action. Unfortunately, today the headlines are not about those protesters and their calls for serious, meaningful change. They are more about riots and tear gas and broken windows and stolen property. That's wrong and must be stopped. But I fear the cry of the people is being drowned out by the noise of the riots. Let me be clear about one thing. People are more important than property. Black lives do matter. Throughout this weekend, I've been briefed by emergency management and public safety officials. State resources have been provided to support the response. Across the state, we saw a pattern in some of our cities. Protests and demonstrations held earlier in the day that remained focused, powerful, and nonviolent. Then as night set in, a different crowd shifted to a more aggressive, more disruptive display. Storefront windows and government buildings were damaged. Retail stores were looted. Small businesses already struggling under COVID-19 were damaged. I communicated with some of them today and people were out there helping them clean up. Good. Fires burned. A civil rights museum, the site of the 1960 Woolworth sit-in, was damaged. And for a short time, a major highway was shut down. Violence and destruction is unacceptable. In many ways, those actions undermine peaceful pleas for justice. I am so thankful for those who passionately demonstrated and for the EMS workers, the law enforcement officers, and the municipal officials who provided a space for voices to be heard. It was sometimes an exhausting and fearful night for them. We're fortunate, however, that none of these incidents resulted in death or critical injury. And I'm thankful for all of those who work so hard to keep the peace. I've spoken with the mayors of Raleigh, Charlotte, Greensboro, and Fayetteville. Their requests for state support in the form of Highway Patrol, SBI, and National Guard are being fulfilled. 
I've urged these mayors to work closely with their police departments to prioritize de-escalating tensions. And I've encouraged them to meet with protest organizers in their cities to continue the dialogues that they already have been having and open dialogues with others that they haven't been having. They have tough jobs, and we want to help. We must stop this destruction. But I want to remind everyone of something vitally important. We cannot focus so much on the property damage that we forget why people are in the streets in the first place. Racism, excessive use of force, health disparities, poverty, white supremacy. These are wrong. They are ugly, but they are present. We must deal with them. George Floyd's sister, Bridget, lives in Hope County, North Carolina. I spoke to her yesterday by phone. While I cannot bring her brother back, I can work for justice in his name, I assured her that's what we would do. This is a painful moment for our country and our great state of North Carolina. We have to constructively channel our anger, frustration, and sadness to force accountability and action. If we don't, then we haven't learned anything. We have to have these hard conversations and then move beyond them to do the work of fighting racism and building safe, thriving communities for everyone. With me today is our Department of Public Safety Secretary, Eric Hooks. American Sign Language is provided by Karen Magoon and Nicole Fox. Spanish Language Interpretation is by Jackie and Jasmine Mativier. I now want to have uh, Secretary Hooks to speak a moment. Secretary Hooks. Thank you, Governor. It's an honor to serve as the Secretary of the Department of Public Safety and to live in our great state. I understand there's a great deal of pain in our communities in our state and across this nation. The pain has been longstanding and did not begin last week in Minneapolis with the tragic and unnecessary death of Mr. Floyd. However, Mr. Floyd's death has provided a flashpoint in communities across the nation. This flashpoint has shown a light once again on the disparities, divides, and the need for redress and healing. I know this pain through my own life experiences as I've had to have the talk with my own son that everyone may not treat him fairly, but as a child created in the image of God, I had the highest expectations for him. The same is true of a group of 13-year-olds that I'm privileged to coach from various racial backgrounds. The highest ethical standards should govern every aspect of law enforcement, and true justice demands equal treatment for all racial and ethnic groups. To those of us who are truly committed to public safety, we must continue to uphold the sacred trust as confirmed by our oaths to support and protect all communities we serve. However, as a citizen, and as a career public safety professional, I can never, ever condone violent behavior in our streets. Dr. King admonished us in his words that while we are in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. As we call for calm and as we navigate the events in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina will support our local partners who are equally committed to preserving life and property. The North Carolina State Highway Patrol, the North Carolina National Guard, the State Capitol Police, the State Bureau of Investigation, alcohol law enforcement, and emergency management have been engaged with me and our local partners across the state to promote and enhance public safety. The governor has authorized approximately 450 National Guardsmen 
to assist in our public safety efforts. Thank you, Governor. We'll now take some questions. If you could identify yourself and uh, the news organization you represent, please. Our first question will come from Travis Fain with WRAL. WRAL, uh, kind of like 450 guardsmen have been uh, activated to assist. Can you tell us what they will be doing, uh, where generally they will be doing it? and then also whether or not there are going to be any curfews in effect in the state that you know of tonight. Thank you, Travis. Our National Guardsmen are available uh, upon request of local governments, and I believe that right now we have requests from Charlotte and from Raleigh for assistance. Uh, some of these uh, Guardsmen are trained in how to protect structs, public structures, and uh, that is how they will be used. What I will do is have uh, General Hunt come forward to talk about uh, the people that, uh, these are, are citizens who have been activated uh, by the Guard, and we want to make sure that they are available to our cities that, that request them. Uh, General Hunt. Uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Travis, for the question. Uh, before I answer your question, I would like to uh, just say one one thing, um, that I am so thankful for the men and women of, and the citizen soldiers of the North Carolina National Guard. As we all know, for the last 80 days, they've been supporting COVID-19, and they have again answered the call uh, when our state needs it. So like the governor mentioned, they will be providing security and support for our DPS and emergency management and local law enforcement partners out there. They are trained in civil disturbance and uh, protection of um, sensitive items and infrastructure throughout the state. Some of this, uh, our soldiers have participated in live riots before, and many of them were in the 2016 during the uh, incident in Charlotte. So they are well trained and they are ready to uh, assist when our state needs us the most. Thank you. And we are grateful for the members of the Guard who are doing all kinds of duties during this COVID-19 emergency that we face, helping to deliver supplies and coordinate uh, food deliveries. Uh, it's just so many things that they are doing to help us with technology and, and other issues, and we're grateful uh, for these men and women. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Don Vaughn with the News and Observer. Hi, this is Don Vaughn with the NNO. Um, you said the National Guard is available, and some are trained in how to protect, uh, protect public structures, but also talking to local governments about police de-escalation and people being more important than property. How, how do you balance those two things if the guard is coming in at local request? It is difficult to balance for police as they are working in their various cities across the state. Uh, we want to make sure, and I've said this to mayors to whom I have talked, that they use as much de-escalation training as they possibly can uh, to make sure that violence is stopped. I do know that many of the mayors have told me that peaceful protests occurred during most of the day in these cities and that night different people came in and they have various strategies to maintain order. We want to give people who want to express their opinions room and space and time to do that. This is such an important issue right now in our state and country, and those voices must be heard. But we're all worried about violence and destruction overshadowing that message. And anything that police can do to de-escalate is something that we want. I was on a conference call last night with uh, the various commands, and I know that they are working hard to make those tough decisions that are on the ground. I know that they are all very tired, 
but we want them to, to have the support that, that they have requested. And remember that people are there for a message that is very important, and we want them the, the ability to bring that message forth. Thanks. Uh, next question. Our next question comes from Chandler Morgan, WBTV. Hi, Governor Cooper. This is Chandler Morgan from WBTV. Quick piggyback off of an earlier question, if there is going to be a curfew in effect for any cities. And then also, as it relates to the demonstrators growing for the protest each day here, at least in Charlotte, many are wearing masks but a large number also are not. Do you worry that the size of these gatherings and how it circles back to properly socially distancing? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the individual cities are making decisions about curfews. I do believe that Fayetteville City Council met this afternoon and we're going to impose one. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten the latest reports about other decisions that other cities have made, and maybe uh, Eric can can talk about that in, in a minute. Yes, we continue to worry about the spread of COVID-19, and when you think about that, and I talked about health disparities, uh, this virus is hitting the black community and communities of color in a disproportionate, disproportionate way than they are a percentage of the population. And it, it is part of the health disparities and frustrations that are out there, and we're trying to, to, to focus on that. But we, we do want people, when they are protesting, to wear masks and to be socially distant and to try to reduce the spread of this vir virus. Uh, First Amendment protests are exempted under the executive order, but we want people to be as careful as we possibly can because we're continuing to face uh, greater numbers. Uh, I'll be talking about that more this week about some things that we need to do to make sure that we bolster our testing and tracing. We're trying to do more about putting more testing and tracing in our minority communities and historically underserved communities to make sure we get that out there and to try to slow the spread of this virus. We're all going to have to work together on this. Thanks. Uh, next question. That was our final question. Back to you, Governor. Um, uh, let me ask Eric if he can tell us about city curfews.